I then went to, as registrar, to the Department of uh, Respiratory Diseases uh, in the university, and that was with uh, John Croft. It was my first experience of somebody of really of that calibre. Right. And the research that was going on at that time. By the way, um, John Crofton's unit at that time was in Southfield Hospital. And I spent a year at Southfield before going down to the <coughs> Northern General Hospital. But right. that was the... Uh, Tuberculosis, yes. Department of Tuberculosis Centre. Right. And this is when the, the studies of what were good chemotherapy were being done and being published. Yes. And it was slow in getting acceptance. But it, it, it was really very exciting to see what was being, being done. I was in the only consultant for 400 tuberculosis beds oh, in, in uh, Edinburgh. Um, of course, I battled pretty quickly, but there was, there was such an enormous uh, TB thing, you know, it was increasing all the time, uh, that I, I didn't have tremendous difficulty in persuading the health board to appoint uh, two more consultants. We, we knew that uh, the drug resistance had developed with the streptomycin alone when it came in. Yes. Very shortly after mm -hmm. that, um, PAS became available, and I, I was involved with the MRC trials, when they, they, they took three groups, uh, one with streptomycin alone, one with, streptom uh, one with PAS alone, and one with both of them, and the resistance rate was lower in, in, in this. Um, so it looked as if um, there were good theoretical reasons for thinking that it would reduce the failure rate. But when we took the whole thing Took, when we came here, we inherited a lot of failures of treatment. And our main research, which we concentrated on then, was looking at these failures and trying to decide why they failed. And this thing worked in the test tube, if some got cured, why didn't others? And we looked at absorption of drugs and, you know, severity of disease and various factors, and worked very close with our bacteriologists, we had sort of long sessions every week looking at great detail of patients. Um, and we concluded that the failures were all due to drug resistance. And in so many of these, when you looked at what had happened and how the drugs had been used, it looked as if they hadn't been used consistently together. But also we found only two cases, one of Normans and one of Ian Grant's, fairly early on, uh, turned out to have been infected by a niacinamide resistant organism. But you didn't know for six or eight weeks. By the time they knew they were giving two drugs, they'd become resistant to the second drug. So we started the giving all three drugs together. And to our astonishment, by being meticulous, we found we weren't getting any failures, but nobody believed us. Uh, quite early in the period, Ian Ross analysed all our cases, and naturally enough, nobody, you know, it was notoriously relapsing disease. Yes. Nobody knew how long. You tended to treat longer if it was bad disease. And Ian Ross analysed ours, and found right paradoxically, rather, uh, that the people who'd had uh, six months or less had, I think it was 22% relapse rate, even though many of these were the milder disease. Yes. Um, the, the, the ones who had uh, 12 to 18 months, the relapse rate was in, only 1%. And although they were very bad cases, whom we'd gone on and on because they were so awful, had no relapse at all. Uh, and that was chance. I mean, we'd done what we thought from looking at the umbilicus might be like, and it was fairly clear that the prolonged treatment was highly effective. So then we started, of course, treating everybody for 18 months, two and years. Initially, the reaction of the world was somewhat sceptical. Oh, very. I mean, we were accused of fiddling our figures. Uh, somebody, once at a meeting in Oxford, said, oh, we, we know. We've had somebody who, who works with you who said that uh, when a patient doesn't uh, r respond, you send him out of hospital and don't count him. And I say, by God, tell me his name. I'll have him up for criminal libel. Of course, it was just a bar gossip in London. Yes. But that was the attitude. 
I mean, it was only really because streptomycin was so short, there was only a limited amount that people regarded as ethical on the first. Oh, there was a lot of stuff about guinea pigs in the newspapers. Um, but of course, it was the only moral way of doing it. Um, no, I, I, this, this, was, this was a very real problem. No, we, we really only got our things accepted because the only people who really did believe this were the bacteriologists in the Pasteur Institute. <laughs> we knew well and we'd come and see. And one of them, we were both chairman of committees in the International Union, said the only thing to do is to let people see it themselves. But everybody was so sceptical, we couldn't say it's a trial of the Edinburgh method or anything like that. So we said a study of the causes of failure in far advanced pulmonary tuberculosis. But they agreed to the protocols of treatment which we put in. And then this was coordinated. It was the first international therapeutic trial, I think, in any disease, actually. We got Reg Bignall, who might work with in London, who also didn't believe our results, to coordinate it, which he did very brilliantly. And there were a few odd people who died in the first week because we were taking far advanced patients, but pretty well all the failures were when they mucked around with the treatment and, and didn't keep to the protocols, and everybody was then convinced.